Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Before I got started reading what I'm going to read and share with you this morning, I wanted to show you my cute little manger scene that I picked up this year at Publix of all places. And I added these little lights and they go from the back window, which actually has four, like divider. If you can see, isn't that cute? It's just so precious. I love the nativity scenes. And now, um, and I, and I wrapped, I wrapped them behind like that. And, and then they end at the star. Okay, so I'll go ahead and turn this off and set it aside. I just wanted to share that with you. Because that's, that's what I love most about Christmas is the nativity scenes. But many people, understand that Jesus was not really actually born December 25th but more likely was conceived if not on the day very close to it and what I'm about to read to you is about the Feast of Tabernacles when it was why it was and why many believe that he was born then. All right, this is one that I got, and I'm going to try to just keep it on it. And it takes batteries. Well, I don't know if I can do that or not. Maybe not, but I can share it with you. And it takes batteries, and the lights twinkle. Isn't that precious? It's like tapestry hung on a pole. And it's normally in this window over here, but because there's a table there now, I didn't want to move everything off the table to get it on there. Okay, so let's get started. This is kind of, it can be kind of lengthy. It might seem a little boring, but then it gets better. And then I'm going to read Luke chapter 2, the account in the Bible of when Jesus was born. All right, I'm going to get started now with now the site. This site is far better than the one I was originally reading and it was called New World Encyclopedia. And I was like, "Wait a minute. New World Encyclopedia? I don't think so." And I decided I'm not using this site <laughs> as my reference. So, this one is Hebrew Roots by Wikibooks. And it's Hebrew Roots slash Holy Days slash Tabernacles slash Tabernacles slash History of the Feast. Now, this is going to tell you what they did and why many believe this is when Jesus was actually born. Okay? And this this was interesting, very interesting to me. It has some things in here I had not heard. And they give you scripture quotations so you can look it up in the Bible. So if you want to pause this and just get a piece of paper and a pencil. Um, you can jot down the references and look them up later if you want or pause the video and look them up however you want to do it all right starts off with historic observance of the feast of tabernacles this feast is first mentioned in the scriptures at sinai with the giving of the law in exodus 23 14 through 16. Now here is where I, I've i got a question. You know, um, let me read it. This is the law that was first given. All right. I may need to get, let me move this up a little bit. Let's check my position. Okay. Now. That might be better. All right. This feast is first mentioned in the scriptures at Sinai with the giving of the law in Exodus 23, 
verses 14 through 16 as the feast of ingathering. This feast has more day, more names than anybody. <laughs> anyway, it's the feast of ingathering. Okay, it was to be celebrated after they entered the land. At the end of the year, after gathering in the fruits of their labors from the field, as one of the three times in the year, which all males were to come and appear before Yahweh God to worship him. The typology for it was established during the wilderness journey when they dwelt in booths or sukkahs. sukkahs. The T at the end is, is silent. A lot of people call this the Feast of Sukkot, but the, the booth is a sukkah. All right. A Hebrew teaching Jewish lady that just passed away this year she taught me a lot because <laughs> I would be talking to her about Jewish stuff and she would correct my pronunciation all the time. So anyway, um, did you catch that where it said all males were to come and appear before Yahweh God to worship him? Okay, we know that back then, God's appearance was in the Ark of the Covenant, right? The Ten Commandments, once the Ark was built, nobody could touch it or they would die. I mean, that had the presence of God in it. It was holy, and it went into the Holy of Holies. And the one priest whose turn it was to go in there, it, 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 was, it became so necessary because priests would drop dead when in there not prepared properly, spiritually, that they would start wearing bells, uh, like a string with bells on it. it um, if he didn't come out of there in the amount of time he should have, the person on the in the the next area, let's see, you had the outer court, inner court, and then the Holy of Holies. So the person where the only males were allowed, one of them could pull on that and ring the bells and see if it didn't move. If it if he if the man didn't say anything, they knew he was dead. Okay, that's how serious this was. Okay. So, don't you believe that this means they were to come and appear before Yahweh God? That meant they were to come to the temple, to where the temple was. Which at the time of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, it was in Jerusalem. Okay. The typology for it was established during their wilderness journey when they dwelt in booths okay and I didn't even realize that they dwelt in booths in the desert that's how they stayed out of the the what, wind storms uh, when it was really cold at night it was really hot in the day when they were not walking they threw up a, a booth a sukkah and that's where they dwelt. Okay, so let me move on. This is in the wilderness. The word Sukkot is first mentioned in the Bible where Jacob built such shelters for his cattle. And the place was thereafter called Sukkoth, Sukkoth. Yes, Sukkoth. Genesis 33. 17. The first place where the Israelites camped after coming out of Egypt on their exodus was called Sukkoth also. That's in Exodus 12, 
37, and also Numbers 33, verses 5 and 6. Quote, In ancient Israel, booths were common were Booths were in common use throughout the land. The Hebrew word sukkah originally meant woven. See, there they've got it spelled S-U-K-K-A-H. So you know to, that's the pronunciation, sukkah. Originally meant woven. Temporary shelters were woven together from branches and leaves to protect livestock. How about your kids? Genesis thirty-three seventeen, To provide resting places for warriors during battle. That's in 2 Samuel eleven eleven. I thought, wow, that's a lot of one ones. 2 Samuel, which is written as 1 1 Samuel 11 11. To shelter watchers in the vineyard. That's in Isaiah 1 8. And to protect the people from the incessant heat of the merciless Middle Eastern sun. During the harvest time, Israelite fields were dotted with such booths, woven hastily together as temporary homes for the harvesters. Mitch and Zava Glaser in the fall of Israel. That's got to be a book or a publication of some nature. They don't even have quotes around it. The Fall of Feasts of Israel, page 157. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt, what they say. When the Jews left Egypt. I mean, they may know. They may have done all the research. I'm not saying their book's no good, okay? I didn't mean to imply that. When the Jews left Egypt and began wandering in the barren desert, they were unarmed, unprotected, and left vulnerable to the elements of wind, cold, bandits, and animals. Since they were constantly traveling, God and... You know what? If, if, if I was... A, uh, bandits coming upon someone being protected by a column of fire by night or a strange cloud by day, I don't think I would approach him. I'd be like running the other way. Don't you think so? I do. I believe God protected them. I don't think that's right to say they were unprotected. All right. So moving on. Since they were constantly traveling, God instructed them to build flimsy temporary booths called sukkah. That, and this is a quote, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh, your God. And that is quoted from Leviticus 23, verse 43. This section is called In the Promised Land. So now they're in the Promised Land. The Feast of Tabernacles was first celebrated by Israel when they were in the... Oh, I started to say, if all the men, if only men, were required to go worship before God, It just seems to me that that would leave women like Mary who was expecting to deliver. See, it didn't say women couldn't go. It just said men were commanded. So, I am wondering. This is just me wondering, throwing that out there. If during the time of Christ... This emperor that, you know, if this is true in the word of God, and, I, you know, I, I hate saying that, but we know that first the Jews and then the Catholic Church came along, took books out. Who knows what words they took out and added in? We know Jesus told me in a message a couple years or so ago, 
that the word of God was made to be kept good enough for us to learn his commandments and how to live or something like that. It's good enough for us to know, to study, to learn what he wanted us to learn. Okay? So don't we can't be thinking, well, if that one line is wrong. I'm not reading the whole book. That's just throwing the baby out with the bath water. You see the point? You wouldn't do that, okay? So you take what's good, and if the part you're not sure of, you just leave it. Leave it up to God. Ask God, or, or if he don't answer, don't worry about it, all right? There's parts of the Bible I don't get, like the parts about there's is there two groups of 144,000? I know the bride's supposed to be the uh, 144,000, but then in Revelation chapter 7, it talks about the 144,000 that are sealed with the seal of God in their forehead. I think those are Jews, uh, people. Jews that have not been raptured and aren't being raptured because they don't yet believe in Jesus. But they're good and they're orthodox and they're following the laws, you know, the best they can. They've reinstituted the temple by then. So now they're doing their animal sacrifices again and they're doing it out of love for God. Perhaps it's them. That's what I'm thinking. All right, let me move on, because this is not about that. I'm just saying I have questions, too, and I don't know the answers, and we don't have to know it all, nor should we pretend to. The Feast of Tabernacles was first celebrated by Israel when they were in the Promised Land. It commemorated the wilderness wanderings and illustrated the tabernacle in the wilderness the tent of God, in the midst of the tents of Israel. Remember that? They did have a great big tent to, um, I guess, as their temple. I always wondered how that many people could live in that tent. Well, they couldn't. They lived around it in the shape of a cross, if I remember correctly. All right. In the midst of the tents of Israel. Okay, yeah. The big tent was in the midst of the tents in Israel. The command of God to observe the festival of tabernacles comes at the end of Yahweh's commands concerning the seven festivals. In Leviticus 23 verses 34 through 36, quote, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the feast. My mind right away went to September 15th, but that's not what it means, of course. That's the seventh Hebrew month. So, um... Anyway, I don't know the months good enough to make a comment on that. I should have looked it up, but I didn't think of it till just now. And I have read this all already. The 15th day of the 7th month shall be the feast or festival of tabernacles for seven days unto Yahweh. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. On the eighth day shall be an holy convocation unto you, and you shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. It is a solemn assembly, and you shall do no servile work therein. For seven days the people of Israel moved out of their houses and lived day and night in small arbors. Okay, so 
here's here's why that question of only men were required to go but this says for seven days the people of Israel moved out of their houses that sounds like women and children and built them near their houses okay let me keep going in small arbors, which could also be called huts, booths, or tabernacles. These were to be temporary shelters made of a few upright posts or poles with a few rods across the top on which branches of thick trees were laid. Branches of thick trees were laid to form a brush arbor roof. And brush arbor is in quotes. The Sukkoth, which should be Sukkah, were made, maybe that's the, that's the plural, Sukkoth, were made of four main types of branches. The palm as a symbol of victory, the willow for weeping, the myrtle for joy, and the olive to represent fruitfulness. For an entire week, they ate in and socialized in the sukkah. They learnt Torah, learnt, <laughs> how about learned Torah in the sukkah, and weather permitting, even slept in the sukkah, the sukkah became their temporary home. That was Deuteronomy 16, verse 15. All right, now this is during the first temple period. Listen to this. The next mention of the Feast of Tabernacles in the scripture occurs when Solomon dedicated the newly constructed temple of God during his reign, the temple was dedicated in 1004 B.C., exactly 1,000 years before the birth of Yeshua the Messiah, the true living temple of God. Now, there are scriptures but I'm sure they refer to the Messiah being the true temple of God. John 2, 19-21, Ephesians 2, 21-22, and Ephesians 4, verses 15 and 16. They do not have a reference to how they know Jesus was born exactly 1,000 years before I mean, after the 1004 B.C. I would like to see uh, mm, a reference there myself. Anyway, keep in mind the Hebrew Roots Movement wrote this. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. Okay, that's from 1 Kings 8, 2, also in 2 Chronicles 7, 8 through 10. The feast was reinstituted and kept in the days of King Hezekiah, 2 Chronicles 31, verse 3. Now, whether or not Sukkot or Tabernacles was regularly celebrated during the period of the first temple is not clear. After the return from Babylon, Nehemiah wrote that from the days of Joshua's crossing into the land of Israel until his own day, the children of Israel had not built the huts of Sukkot. And that's in Nehemiah 8.17. That's after the return from Babylon. 
Nehemiah wrote that from the days of Joshua's crossing into the land of Israel until his own day, the children of Israel had not built the huts of Sukkot. But from Nehemiah's time onward, the festival continued to be celebrated during the time of the second temple. Now, this next section is about the time of the second temple. But I want to move forward to the Feast of Tabernacles in the time of Yeshua. Many scholars believe Yeshua was born during the Feast of Tabernacles. Matthew Henry states, It is supposed by many that our blessed Savior was born much about the time of this holiday. Then he left his mansions of light above to tabernacle among us, John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and he dwelt among us, which the word dwelt means tabernacled, okay? And he dwelt in booths. He left his mansions of light above to tabernacle among us, and he dwelt in booths. Well, see, that's what I believe. That's what a lot of scholars do believe, but I'd like to see a reference to that. And the worship of God under the New Testament is prophesied of under the notion of keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. Zechariah fourteen sixteen, for one the gospel of Christ teaches us to dwell in tabernacles. The gospel of Christ teaches us to dwell in tabernacles, to sit loose in this world. Oh, that's not in sukkahs. In other words, our homes are we're to think of our homes as temporary shelters. That this land is not my home. This is not my home. This is a temporary shelter because I'm going to heaven. Heaven is my home. That's what they mean. To sit loose to this world as those that have here no continuing city, but by faith, and hope and holy contempt of present things to go out to Christ without the camp. To go out to Christ without the camp. That's Hebrews 13, 13 and 14. The Bible does not specifically say the date of Jesus' birth. We know it was not during the winter months, December in our calendar, because the sheep were in the pasture, Luke 2, 8. The sheep were not outside in the freezing cold in the winter. In John 7, 2 through 53 to chapter 8, the events of the last Feast of Tabernacles are recorded where Yeshua reveals himself as the fulfillment of the symbols used in the Feast of Living Water. That's in verses 37 through 39. And the light of the world, which was symbolized in the giant menorah in the courtyard of the women. And then it's got 8 through 12. John 8. 12. I'm sorry, John 8, 12. It was during this festival of Sukkot, Sukkot that Moses and Elijah, representatives of the Torah and the prophets, appeared and talked with Yeshua in anticipation of the millennial kingdom which the feast represents. Peter suggested building three sukkahs for them, or sukkoth for them, as required for the festival. 
indicating that he understood the millennial significance of their appearance in their glorified state. Matthew 17, 1 through 5. Yes, he did said it would be good for us to build a sukkah for you, Lord, and for one for Elijah and one for Moses. So it does kind of indicate that that happened during Feast of Tabernacle, but it doesn't indicate that Peter understood the millennial significance. I think that's reading into it. Correct me if I'm wrong. If you get that out of scripture, let me know. Continued observance in the present age. All right, I'm not going to go into that. That's for people who want to try to keep what was given to the Israelites. Jew or not, you do not have to keep any of the laws of the Old Testament. However, these were festivals. Some of them were appointed as commandments to be kept. But all the commandments given in the Old Testament, so many hundreds of laws, we cannot keep, nor should we want to. The Lord gave us two, and they encompass many of the Old Testament laws, but also do away with many of them, like the need to kill somebody for not keeping the Sabbath. And now it's no longer just do not commit adultery. Now it's if you so much as lust after a married woman it is married woman. I was listening to a video. The guy took the oldest version of the Bible. He looked up the meanings, and it's supposed to say married woman has committed adultery with her already in her heart, in his heart. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 1. Now, in those days... A decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. I'd like to get that in there. Let me try it. All right. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. So I was thinking, maybe they knew that everybody went back to their hometown to celebrate tabernacles with family. And then, I, that's why I started doing research on, was it commanded for them to come to Jerusalem? And it sounds like it was commanded for them to come to where God was, which is where the temple would have been. But now, God does not dwell in temples made by human hands. But as of the birth of Jesus he still would have been considered as dwelling in the temple in Jerusalem, right? So don't you think that if it was tabernacles, all the families would have been flocking to Jerusalem, not to their hometown, but the law of the Romans might have prevented them from celebrating like they wanted to or were told to by God. It's just food for thought, okay? So everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Because here's another point. Satan loves to interfere with everything. He knew that was a law. For men to go to Jerusalem. But yet. And, but then it says the people were to 
leave their houses, set up a sukkah, and celebrate tabernacles for a week. And it doesn't really say they all traversed to Jerusalem or traveled. All right, I'll move on. Starting with verse 4. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David. In order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child, while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths. Okay, she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger. Okay, I'm going to switch this King James Come on. There we go. Verse 7. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them at the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not! For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Okay, I better not sing any more of that or I'll get a copyright strike. So let's move on. New paragraph, and it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying, and so they... The shepherds, the lowliest of all human beings who couldn't even go to the temple because they didn't even have proper clothing. You had to be clean. You couldn't touch dead animals, the filth from the animals, all that left you unclean. 
so they couldn't even go to the temple. They were the lowliest of the Jews, according to the Jewish law, okay? Or Israelite law, I should say, because it wasn't Jewish law. The Judeans were eventually called Jews for short. All right, now, so we've got these lowly shepherds going out and telling people what had happened. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen and it was told unto them. And when eight days were accomplished, see that's all we get. The babe, let me back up just a little bit. All right. So it came to pass, the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even into Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. He was not born in a manger. Okay, so many people say he was born in a manger. No, he was born in some kind of place where there was a manger, whether it was a sukkah or whether it was some kind of stable. He was laid in a manger. And somewhere I read, and couldn't find this here to tell you, they put a manger in the sukkahs to put their food in. It was like a manger. I'm sure it wasn't the one their animals ate out of regularly because they put their food in it. Their bread. Jesus is the bread of life. So it all makes perfect sense that it could have been a sukkah. And that he was laid in the manger that was made for the bread and fruits and things they would have eaten while they stayed out in their little hut, their sukkah. Okay, so then it, it just says, And when they had seen it, they made known abroad, and saying the saying which was told them concerning this child. And they all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. So they were the first evangelists. Think about that. So you could be one too. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen and was told unto them. And then it just goes on to talk about when the eight days were accomplished, they went and had him circumcised and called his name Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. All right, she was told to call him Emmanuel, which was named, means Christ with us. So that that confuses me. Why is that? Why was he not called Emmanuel? Why was she not told to name him Jesus? There's got to be a reason. I'm going to pull up on tools, under tools. I'm going to pull, let me pull this back down and put me back here now so it's a little more comfortable. All right. Now I'm going to pull down real quick and then I'm going to end this because I know it's getting on. But you may have this question also. It's G2424 Aesus, because there was not a J yet. I know that. That doesn't mean we can't call him Jesus. It says of Hebrew origin 3091. We'll go there next. It means Jesus, Jesus, Joshua, two times. Jesus as justice, one time. All right. It means Jehovah is salvation, which is God. Jehovah God is salvation. 
And then there's Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of mankind, God incarnate. B, Jesus Bar Barabbas was the captive robber whom the Jews begged Pilate to release instead of Christ. Now, isn't that something? That God had him called Jesus who died for all of mankind, and yet, knowing Barabbas would also be named Jesus Barabbas, who was the captive robber whom the Jews begged Pilate to release instead of Christ. I find that really, I mean, it's like, what are the, that, that's no way that's a coincidence. There's no way that's a coincidence. I mean, that was all worked out ahead of time. That His parents were told to call him Jesus. Joshua was a famous captain of the Israelites. That's C, D, Jesus, son of Eleazar, one of the ancestors of Christ, which could be why he was called Jesus. And Jesus, surnamed Justice, a Jewish Christian, an associate with Paul in the preaching of the gospel. Okay, so see, there's no area where it says it was actually a very common proper name among the Israelites. So it was common. There had to be a reason God wanted people calling him a common name. All right. Now I want to look at a Hebrew origin H3091. For those of you who are still with me in this very long video, it's a variant spelling for this word, which is Hebrew. I can't read it. Strong's and Justinius, another Hebrew word. Can't read it. It's Yehoshua. This is where I think it's the Hebrew Roots Movement calls him Yehoshua. That's Hebrew. And nowhere does it say we had a call him his Hebrew name. But the King James Version translates H3091 in the following manner. Joshua. 218 times. So one, Joshua or Jehoshua equals Jehovah is salvation. So Joshua was a type and shadow of Jesus. He had the 12 tribes, right? Joshua, Caleb, Joshua. He's, yeah, he was named from Israel. He was given the name Israel. He was given 12 tribes. And Jesus had 12 apostles. Okay, and these are all governor of Jerusalem, different people that are named Joshua. So that's a little bit of a mystery to me also. Why Mary was told to call him Emmanuel for it meant God with us. But Jesus means uh, same as Joshua. Jehovah is salvation. So that's another thing we can take to the Lord. But it doesn't matter. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He came to save the world. He came to die on the cross. And I'd like to reiterate right here that the moment he died, he exclaimed, Tetelestai, which means the debt is paid in full. I don't know where people get the word, it is finished. They Bibles translate it, it is finished. I guess that's why. 
but the original King James Version will tell you it says Tetelestai, or at least in the footnotes. And he cries out, it is finished. But he cried out Tetelestai, which means the debt is paid in full. He fulfilled the laws of the Old Testament and provided grace. He provided grace that anyone who believed in him might be saved. For God so loved the world that whosoever might believe in him or would believe in him Whosoever believeth in him, Lord, I need my brain right now. I know this scripture by heart, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It is not shall not perish. The new versions say, shall not perish. And this is where a whole lot of people, one of the very many scriptures, well, actually not very many, there's about a dozen scriptures you could quote when taken out of context, does back up, once saved, always saved. Like, no man can take you out of my hand. Or, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And that is so true because he could have left me a bunch of times when I was an adulterous whore. Saved, truly saved, baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I had to have a man in my life. I had to. I was not a stable enough person yet to know that God Almighty that I couldn't see and Jesus Christ his son could be enough for me I couldn't fathom that no one taught me that I had to learn it so the God of mercy will have mercy on those of you who haven't had time to learn it all yet so don't be afraid just do what you know to do. Do what you already know to do. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, soul, and with all your strength. You work on that. You work on relationships. How do you do that? By reading the word, by praying, talking, communicating, singing praise and worship songs. Okay, commandment two, love your neighbor as yourself. These are the commandments Jesus gave to us. Okay, these are the ones he had penned into the word of God for you and me, you and me, to follow. But loving your neighbor as yourself requires doing. It requires helping them out when they're poor. We can't think of ourselves so highly that we think, well, I've got to have thus and so, so I can't afford to help pitch in on so-and-so's needs. Or you're driving down the road, man standing there, we'll work for food. Lord puts it in your mind, go buy him a burger. And you're like, Lord, I'm in such a hurry. And you're driving along, and you're driving along, and bumpity, bumpity, you're driving, oh, all right. And you turn around and you go get him a happy meal because that's the cheapest thing on the menu. And you go, here, here's some food. Or you could buy what you would want. Or you could do it not at all. Which would be more pleasing. Buying the one you wanted. Even if it meant going without yourself. That is what 
Jesus meant love your neighbor as yourself. If you have to eat because you're diabetic or you had to skip breakfast because you had to help somebody else out, buy the Happy Meal and get yourself one and then you both get fed. And that'll be fine with Jesus. Okay? I hope I made sense with that one. Alright, I love you all so very much. And I hope that everybody on my channel understands that grace is such a beautiful gift. But Jesus did teach us the Lord's Prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer. And part of it says, and forgive us our trespasses, and I will forgive those who trespass against me. Those are sins. Those are wrongdoings. Wrong thinking. It didn't used to be a sin to think wrong. It is now. And we have to ask forgiveness for all those things we do wrong. Why not every night? Just to keep your slate clean. Huh? What is so hard about that? So, I'll leave it go at that. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ in Nazareth over this video and the internet connection and over each and every one of you as well. And with that, I'll say bye for now. I'll talk to you later.